you. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. So today we have uh, Dr. Judy Pitt, uh, Dr. Judith Pitt, uh, who is a lecturer and research coordinator at the Tangaza University College of the Catholic University of Eastern Africa in Nairobi, Kenya. She recently graduated with her PhD from the Open University Netherlands. Congratulations. At the Thank faculty, you. yes, <laughs> at the faculty of uh, management science and technology with our thesis on OER differentiation across country study in three countries in Africa. She's part of the GOGN network and was one of the researchers involved in the ROE R4D project. She'll tell us more about herself, I'm sure. Judy, you'll tell us more about yourself. And we are happy to have you uh, on this um, uh, webinar of uh, We Prepared for Open. I'm sure you'll tell us what is open. And if we are prepared for it, we'll tell you if we are prepared for it. Please, Judy, uh, um, uh, go ahead and start, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. I'm very privileged, at least uh, happy that uh, we met sometimes back and you're hosting me this afternoon. Then uh, thank you everyone else who has joined us and uh, welcome to this session. Irene, actually, as uh, you've done an excellent introduction to myself, I don't need to add anything else. And uh, one thing maybe probably I need to mention is that uh, I have a lot of passion for open education. Uh, open learning and uh, actually I believe and I guess this is where all of us who are listening to me today uh, also aim at that uh, the future of education is open. Now uh, I will share with you this afternoon uh, my uh, research that I did uh, that uh, is on the differentiation among uh, lecturers and students in Kenya and uh, this sort of differentiation, uh, and we could probably call it the inequalities that exist between the lecturers and students with regards to the use and reuse of OER was quite passionate to me. And I felt it right that, uh, let me pick for the first time in this, uh, I mean, in this chat today to discuss about my findings that uh, for Kenya as a country. Now, uh, I think, um, the reason as to why I chose a topic on OER uh, roots way back in my uh, life history, how I grew up basically in a rural setup, in the village life, and with a lot of hardship here and there, and struggles actually to get the basic needs to acquire the most basic education. And uh, this basically gives me uh, a very good background and uh, strength to talk on issues on which education can be made open, that each and every uh, uh, person, irrespective of where you come from, whether it is in a village setup, whether you are in the urban, whether you are coming from the hard to reach regions, then you can be able to access and then get the required education, which of good quality, and that can also help in transforming someone's life and life of institutions in general. So, I carried out uh, this particular research in differentiations and uh, in terms of uh, you know, digital proficiency, a level of use of OER, and awareness of the licenses that are out there for us to use. And finally, the aspect of the perceived value of OER by both the lecturers and students. I know in other institutions you call, uh, I mean, uh, lecturers educators. So it's basically the same thing. It's just a matter of, I mean, the terms. Here I call them lecturers, but then elsewhere they could be called um, educators. Now, uh, just uh, a brief uh, introduction or in terms of uh, OER, what is the, the African context of the term open? You know, many understandings of this term uh, is everywhere. People understand open educational resources differently. But then for me in the African context and to limit it to Kenyan context over here, uh, I came up with this cover page of my thesis that is showing beautifully and you can see people out there sharing their knowledge in the open and you can see the digital aspect of it out there. And this is rooted uh, in the culture of open, 
which was viewed in relation to the fundamental traditional African values of sharing. And of course, the provision of knowledge without payment. This is where I'm drawing my background to my motivation and love of openness from. Because if I, in, in, like in, in, uh, at home, when you go now to the upcountry lifestyle, I don't think there is a, a guest that would, you know, not all guests uh, set dates on when they come to visit. Not our neighbor, neither will our neighbors join us when we are having a meal. Then we fail to tell them karibu. Karibu means welcome to the meal. Even though we did not really add or budget for them to do this. So that culture of free sharing, open sharing, and without any uh, payment attached to it is what brings the aspect of open education very relevant for Africa. Now, uh, I also uh, built on this cover page the aspect where the elderly men and women could share their practical wisdom and indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge with their younger generations, specifically for purposes of continuity and cultural enrichment. These are concepts that I believe if we embrace and then bring this in the aspects of our higher learning institutions, in the manner in which we share knowledge, the manner in which we teach, the manner in which our learners learn and get educated, then I believe we are going to have the best quality education for us specifically in Africa and also Kenya in, in Kenya. Now, my motivation for this particular topic or to talk about issues on OER in the Kenyan context is that since my childhood, I've always seen, uh, bearing in mind what I went through, the urge to access education without boundaries. How can this be made possible? This is a question that I used to ask myself and I never found answers. So uh, it becomes broader in the sense that with time, as, the, as, as, as I also read and share with a lot of exper experts, I realize that then my motivation could also go broader than just my personal history. And then how can education be made accessible and affordable to all? And I also mentioned the term orphans because I grew up with my mom only. My dad died when I was quite young, uh, less than 10 years. So I was also focusing in that aspect as an orphan. How about those who are in the villages? How can they also access education and afford education so that they can also have a good future? Then we, I also came across the aspect of access to quality education for all. Is it practical? If we don't let our education systems to share their materials freely and openly, then how can we achieve that goal number four of the SDGs of education for all. Then with my experience in the university, there are very few books in the libraries for compulsory courses. And hence competition among students to access the print books is a question that we really have to challenge. Now over here with my experience is that it was survival for the fittest. And you can imagine how some how the, the, the boys versus the men, uh, I mean, the boys versus the girls would be. If you are strong enough, you get the book. But you see, this is a compulsory course that you must undertake. You cannot graduate without this particular course. Now, this are equation that I kept asking myself. But then I got surprised when I noticed the untapped potential of all year in Southern African uh, context. Now, uh, I also noticed that it becomes quite unrealistic when I started teaching eh, to ask my students to buy these expensive textbooks, bearing in mind that I know some of their backgrounds. They hail from very marginalized communities and also real, uh, flashing back on my own uh, uh, life experiences when I was growing up. It was difficult even just to put a meal on the table. Then I asked a student to go and buy a very expensive book for a specific course that I teach, which is a common cause or a core cause, that basically for me becomes very unrealistic. Now, uh, the, untapped, the untapped potentials on OER, therefore, uh, I came across TESA during my study. That is the Teacher Education and Sub-African, the TESA, which had a lot of initiatives 
to promote OER UC. Then I got interested. They said, there is something out here that if it is if tapped by most of our higher learning institutions, then we can be in a position to do what? To transform our education system in which each and every individual, be it from you, whether you hail from the rural area or you hail from the marginalized communities or from those areas which are very hard to reach, then you can access education, quality education materials that can also help in transforming lives. Now, I was very happy and privileged to become a participant in a very good and life skill study that was called the Research on Open Educational Resources for Development, which was basically a large scale study to get a fair OER picture from the global south. And sub-Saharan African countries were also part and parcel of this great research. So Kenya, which is my country, is one was one of the participants in this particular research. Now the this the, the research was under the auspices of our current UNESCO chair, uh, our famous uh, Professor Cheryl Parkinson, who is also who was also the principal investigator. We've learned so much from her, and really, out of our leadership, great things came out from this large scale study which apart from under being taken also undertaken in sub-Saharan Africa, it was also spread all over to South America and Southeast Asia, as you can see the countries in my screen. Now, the turning point, the turning point of my love for OER grew up when I became the African coordinator for the raw for d project, which was a sub-project number two. And then, I also became, from the same, same network, I became a member of the GOGN, Global Graduate OER uh, Network, which supports the PhD researchers and promotes inclusive openness. These are really elements that was quite important for me. And interacting with OER gurus and practitioners, then I grew more interest and I got a lot of passion in terms of researching in this area. Now, for the Kenyan research, uh, the participants, those who basically form part and parcel of this output, includes the, a number of universities in Kenya. I did four public universities, and I mean two public universities and two private higher learning institutions in Kenya. And by the use of questionnaires and through the survey monkey, the data was gathered and analyzed that involved 43 lecturers and 798 students in Kenya. As you can see, when you talk about the sub-Saharan African countries, we were doing the survey in three countries, Kenya, Ghana, and South Africa. But today, I'm limiting my talks to Kenya. Now, what came out of this research? One, I realized that uh, access is seen as one of the basic enablers to use of OER. We also realized that cost implications, speed, and internet st uh, stability has a direct relationship with the use of OER in Kenyan universities. When the cost is so high, very few people will be able to access. When the speed is too low, then very many people will not be in a position to access and use these resources. And of course, where the internet is unstable, we notice that it is almost impossible to talk about the use of these resources. Now, just to mention a little bit on in the aspect of access. Remember, we have regions in this country where electricity is still an issue, power, there are blackouts or some areas are not generally connected. So it, it's still something that we should not ignore when you talk about promoting and motivating people to use OER materials. Now, too, I also noticed that uh, there is a lot of significant differentiation among the lecturers and students in terms of proficiency and devices that are used to access 
the internet, and of course, these resources. Now, for use of these resources, uh, there is, however, a dark in distinguishing between the OER and any other digital resource which is out there for anybody to use. So the aspect of understanding, the awareness of OER, and in general, the open licensing is something that we, we are still wrestling with. So we notice that OE, open, open licensing and sharing of our resources is low in Kenya. And it was pretty low when you compare our urban and rural setup universities. The appreciation of the concept is good because everybody actually currently is using what is out there in the internet to be, I mean, to be used. When I notice, well, our lecturers, you know, uh, access, they pick what they need, they reuse them, they, they, they contextualize it to suit their basic needs, meaning it is positive. And this for us actually is a good sign uh, for preparedness towards the openness in the future. And that will basically help us if we have, we have uh, strategies to implement any open, uh, I mean, open initiatives within the country that will work out because of that positiveness that we realize, positivity among the lecturers and students in with regards to the use of these resources. Now, uh, since access, as we have seen, was one of the most fundamental considerations when conceptualizing OER among the lecturers and students. Now, we realize that despite the well-known structural uh, obstacles that face our higher learning institutions in Kenya. And in terms of OER adoption you know, and use, there is a lot of growing uh, use of the mobile devices which are provided. And this for us we provides a very good pointer on reducing the inequalities that exist. Now, if you have a look at this particular diagram alone, you'll be able to see that apart from the rural setup where we had majority of the students and some lecturers still use the desktop computers, then mobile telephony is something that is being used by most of the people to access internet. And this will also enhance the use of these uh, uh, resources. We also see the aspect of the laptop. Laptop is also growing, actually, uh, irrespective of our, of our economic status. Eh? And uh, reading in between the lines of the, I mean, uh, of, of how uh, economic status are in in this country, more, many people now are using laptop computers to access internet. So access is key. And therefore, even though we are challenged in other ways, but people are using people have these devices to support the usage of OER materials. Now the aspect of connective I've mentioned before is that uh, there is still a lot of challenges in terms of you know how much do we pay for the internet? What's the speed of what I pay for? And is that particular uh, internet stable that will enhance my usage of the available resources that I need can use, reuse, and repurpose to transform my teaching and learning at various institutions. So as we can see, uh, people are still not extremely satisfied with what they have in terms of uh, cost, speed, and stability. And this cut across between lecturers and students and also from the urban and rural setups. Now, Open licensing awareness and in general, the OER uh, engagement levels were generally were very low. But respondents, uh, this is quite interesting and uh, I know we will pick up from here for most of the OER, I mean, the gurus and those who are practicing this, uh, that uh, some respondents indeed created, reused, and share digital resources without any license, with no licensing. And this is something that I think we can build up, build a debate over. How would you share 
what you call OER without an open license. This is a, something that you question, and that also calls for our action that there is need to, I mean, build the capacity of people on how open licensing is important when it comes to sharing of educational resources. So awareness among the lecturers is quite low, as you can see. Awareness among the students is also very uh, pretty low. And that is an alarm. It calls for some action that we have something to do. There's a lot that we need to do to enhance people's uh, knowledge and capacities with regards to the available uh, open licensing. Now, the motivators to use these resources. Remember, uh, many lecturers and students have a lot in their hands to undertake. Those who are learning, those who are doing research, those who are teaching, and those who are doing other, uh, other, other activities. So there are a number of factors that came up during this uh, uh, survey that motivated most of the lecturers to use these resources. The first, uh, 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 the first and most striking was uh, the aspect of these resources bringing down costs for students. Then helping other educated students because they, people believe, majority believe that uh, for a, a, a resource to be put up there as an OER, it must have come from the most reputable institutions. That is one. And two, the fact that most of them which are up there are really peer reviewed. So they're happy to use them because they know they have good quality. Then that I know will bring into a question that I know some of you will ask me in a short while. Then bringing down cost for cost development uh, for the institutions is also a factor that was rated uh, slightly higher by both the lecturers and students. And I think that really is something that we can also pick up from and, and see how best we can build on, 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 on this, um, uh, these concepts. And uh, rated low there was the enhancing, enhancing, the aspect of enhancing the reputations of both the users and the, those who create them. So this is specifically giving us an idea that what will enhance the use what, what um, makes lecturers happy to use the resources and the students as well. So that is basically, and therefore, what are some of the barriers? Why are they not using them? They are available, yes. But how comes we are not getting involved to either create and share, and though we use them? Well, the most uh, uh, prominent <laughs> factor there was lack of access to internet. This cuts across friends. And remember when I was talking about behind I mean, later, I mean earlier on, on the aspect of access. Access is based on a number of relationships built up on a number of, a number of factors like cost, speed, and stability. So you can see both lecturers and students uh, have a barrier of lack of stable internet connectivity that would enhance the use of these resources. Lack of time is key because uh, people feel that it is an extra thing that I must do. So I need to put my priorities right. And they don't give this priority because they don't have that time for it. And then lack of training, capacity is an issue as I have we've seen before. Even just having that element of learning to use the open licensing was, a fa or was really something that uh, came up strongly. Uh, hardware, softwares, you know, depending on what kind of devices that we have, then are we in a position to use them correctly to enhance as uh, the use and all this. So these were some of the barriers that came out from our studies that would, uh, would bar our users to make use of these resources. Then in summary, ICT knowledge, ICT knowledge and its use is the foundation in the, in the utilization of OER for teaching, for learning and research. And as we have seen, especially in Kenya, many learners uh, have, still have very, a need very basic computer skills. What tools do we need to use to access these resources? And then, and also need skills to use those online tools. You know? Basic computer skills that will enhance the use and indeed the skills to use online tools. Then, if we hit back and remember that uh, access was some of the, was the, uh, quite fundamental, 
then the internet access, its stability, and regular access to it would also enhance. But this we did not uh, realize is the case for Kenya. Most regions still are still not connected from power to internet. And bearing in mind the cost implications, that is also something we are still wrestling with. Devices used to access the internet is key. Mobile phones, we see many people are now coming up with mobile technology. I mean, buying mobile technology that they are using to access internet. So these are some, uh, some, uh, some platforms that we can use to send a message home with, when, when it comes to, I mean, promoting OER and OE practices. Then uh, open licensing, low awareness and informal uh, uh, OER engagements. This came out very clearly. We could see how the lecturers and students still have very low knowledge on licensing. And finally, the preparedness for openness, very positive perception. Now the perception, the perception eclipse here gives us a very good leeway on the fact that we still can do something. People have the interest, people want to do something, but still maybe we need to click what is it that they need to do to help us in promoting the use of OER in Kenya. Now, some recommendations that I guess and we came up with, that came up from my research is that we still need to undertake a number of research projects. And in this level, I call upon collaboration between maybe the, uh, the, the, the Northern practitioners uh, that will help us in, an, in deepening the OER practices at local levels. In other words, training local instructors, like what I was sharing earlier, with regards to how can I develop a course? Who can help us to develop courses that can help, uh, can uh, support uh, all online education? And courses of good quality, courses that can help uh, learners and lo the localizing the language to suit the needs of the people on the ground. That is very key for me. So we need to undertake certain collaborative researches that would enhance that. I'm also borrowing from Elhans and Con 2017 that we need to deliberately create communities of practice at the grassroots level. You know, uh, when I work in the city, I'm not very much uh, uh, at par with what is happening on the ground. But then if we engage those who are working at the grassroots level, then they'll give us the right perception of what the, on the reality on the ground on what is missing and how, even the how, how we need to approach them for us to achieve a specific uh, uh, goal is important. Then the aspect of strategies for promoting increased OE engagement is a call that I'm actually uh, putting across to stakeholders, governments, and higher learning institutions so that uh, we can promote and increase OER engagements at various levels. We also need to build capacities. There are gaps to fulfill here from our learning institutions. We need to promote digital literacy, information literacy, the aspect of licensing. It is up to the institutions to see to it that it is their responsibility to provide institutional support to enhance the promotion and the use of, or, or rather the uptake or integration of OER and ICT in our teaching and learning. This will be very helpful. I'm also calling upon the UNESCO and the several governments to develop appropriate policy frameworks that will help. I'm also very interested, I saw a latest release, uh, I mean a document developed up by the UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning on how to come up with policies, OER policies that will support uh, the development and use of OER and ICT in our teaching and learning. Those are quite interesting. I'm also encouraging TESA to continue. OER Africa, we have the, all this uh, in, in Africa and especially in Nairobi, the Africa Virtual University, to develop up support programs for inclusion and integration of ICT and OER in teaching and learning. This will help us to see to it that the differentiation that I'm talking about, the inequalities with regards to undertaking OER and OEP at higher learning institutions are reduced. And this basically 
gives us a good start point for what we need to do to promote OER. Thank you. Back to you, Irene. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, this this uh, is, is quite an eye-opener. Uh, it's so interesting. There are uh, quite a number of, of questions. Um, I am thinking that since we have a bit of time, I'll let a few people ask uh, questions directly. Um, we'll start with, um, I think we'll start with Tony. Tony, you had uh, the first uh, observation or question. Perhaps you could, you could ask it directly instead of me reading it, please. Would you like to go, Tony? Okay, thank you very much. Um, interesting, my video has gone weird. Never mind, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly, Tony. Go ahead. Good, yes, okay. Yes. Um, so, Judith, thank you very much for sharing your research. Um, and it's clear it's driven not just by data and by um, thorough research, it's also driven by passion, and that's wonderful to see. Um, I wanted to ask you the question that I was thinking about right at the end, which is you're talking about many organizations needing to find ways to support OER, and mm -hmm. what can Emerge Africa as a predominantly online professional development network do to support the use of OER in your opinion? Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, uh, that is uh, very uh, quite enriching question. Uh, basically, uh, Emerge Africa has a lot to do in my research. First and foremost, I'm talking about capacity building to our educators. Uh, and you know, it all starts with the knowledge transfer from the educators down to the students, to the learners. So my point for Image Africa is that I need instructional designers to help me with my colleagues over here, who are the educators, the lecturers, so that we can come up with the good courses which are designed and then put out there for open learning, that anybody, anywhere can access them. And at the end of the day, we uphold quality of these resources that are being used out there by others to probably restructure or to lo delocalize them to suit the, their local needs at wherever they are. And my, my focus here is on the grassroots level. People in the hard to reach areas, people who are marginalizing the societies, how can they also access this good quality resources. So my idea is Image Africa, we can collaborate. I need instructional designers to help us come up with these courses. I need capacities built for both the students and the lecturers in terms of how the OER has greater potentials to increase the quality of our educations in Kenya specifically. So I guess we can start from somewhere. But there could be a, a lot of things that we can do together with Image Africa. Uh, thank you, Judy. Uh, we have another um, uh, interesting uh, observation and also I think a question from uh, Jerome. Jerome is from the University of Jos in Nigeria. And he says, I think the idea that resources have to be peer reviewed or somehow perfect before they are shared is problematic. I will get up to there, but perhaps you can share with us what, what, what your observations have been uh, as uh, Jerome prepares for his uh, following question. Jerome, be ready so that you can share uh, your follow-up question on that. Please, Judy. Okay, now Jerome, thank you very much for that. Huh? We talk about peer review. Remember, one of the motiva motivations for our people to use OER is the fact that they believe these uh, resources are peer reviewed and they also hail from very reputable institutions. Now, uh, peer review can be an issue depending on what you are looking for. Now, uh, like in African context, I guess as, as, as we speak now, we have very good people, good quality, uh, 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 resources from reputable institutions which have really used OER for a number of times. For instance, UCT for me is an institution for us in Kenya. 
to benchmark with. I will probe the higher learning institution leadership, at least to benchmark with UCT because there are so much that they've done with regards to these particular resources. So if I can share my research that I've developed with a professor from UCT to help in peer reviewing what we are coming up with, I don't think that could be an issue. But probably the perception or our cultural background still hinders us from sharing and trusting our own at home to review our work. So Jerome, I guess you are coming from uh, the point of view that people don't trust one another's uh, inputs or work. And with this, uh, even if someone gives you an input on what you feel needs to be reviewed, others will not trust it still. But then I think peer review is good. But it also requires a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, caution taken. To whom do you share your work for review, and what are you uh, what are you looking uh, forward to after your work is reviewed, and also what are you reviewing? So I think if we put this in place, Jerome, we will not have a problem in reviewing our uh, educational resources. Remember, these are meant to help people anywhere. And I would be glad to put out my course, which I am very confident that wherever it, it is used, it, uh, the quality is, 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 is up to date, is to the standards of the international standards, and it can be rated by other similar resources out there. So uh, a review could be a problem depending on whom you want your paper reviewed and for what purposes do you want to use or utilize these materials later on. Um, Jerome, do you have a follow-up question? I'm just wondering. I'm pu I'm putting you on the on the spot there, but uh, do you have a follow-up question, or we continue? Thank you, Irene. Well, when I asked that question, uh, there was there was a lot behind it. You see, the explanation Judith has provided uh, is about. Personal arrangement peer review. How does the person who is accessing your work when it is out there know that you reached out to a professor at UCT or elsewhere and got a peer review? Basically, concerns have been raised regarding the quality of homegrown OERs. Uh, are they African standards? Who set these standards? How is there a consensus in terms of the acceptance of these standards? These are some of the issues, and they have hindered some people from fully embracing OER either as consumers or as uh, contributors to it. So that is why I asked that question. There is also the the question of the differences in curricula and the cost of uh, adjusting uh, material to fit the curriculum of a particular institution, even within the same country. Sometimes the cost is so high that uh, it would be better to just start uh, creating the content from scratch. So I, I want to hear from you the experiences you will have in Kenya along these lines. Thank you very much, Jerome, for that clarification. Actually, the aspect of standards and who sets the standards and uh, 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 who are the standard measures, who should we measure our own quality of education resources that, uh, 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 that can help us also to build and gauge what we share out there. This is very key, and uh, it, I agree with you, it's a big challenge for us still within the sub-Saharan African countries, that uh, trusting uh, our own homegrown resources is still uh, 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 something to wrestle with. And uh, I think this is, uh, uh, this is a result of the orientation that we've had with, re with regards to the institutional, uh, I mean, uh, uh, cultures that were built therein, that our own is the best. And what do they have 
that we must compare with the rest, with, with others. So these are certain barriers that I think we still need to uh, actually see, to way, see ways in which we can challenge them. And you've also brought up the as other aspect of cost. Really, cost implications is a challenge. And when it comes to um, the, the, the institutions coming in and chipping in to support some of these elements of uh, uh, the, the designing the courses and sending them out there for peer review, there are institutions that definitely will ask for payment for them to review your work. Now, uh, and bearing in mind on how the, our universities here are stripping with financial constraints. It, is, it becomes almost impossible for the institutions to finance uh, some of these uh, activities that will enhance quality peer reviews. But then we still uh, have a lot of hopes. I believe that if we start drawing, I mean, building up and then sharing this among ourselves, because we understand our own uh, challenges at home. We know our own institutions. We know our own cultures that exist in our institutions. Then I believe we can trust one another from, uh, uh, from our own uh, level of understanding. We, uh, for instance, if you talk about the aspect of language, if the language is a problem to our own students to understand the, the, the OER resources that are meant there for their educational learning and teaching, then we can come up with uh, translators who can build and who can also delocalize these particular um, uh, languages to a level where our students understand them, bearing in mind their own grassroots I mean, uh, needs. Now, if I develop a, a, a course in Kiswahili, I peer review this particular uh, course with another university in Tanzania, because we know Tanzanians are the gurus in Kiswahili, then I, I can easily trust that this particular work has been re peer reviewed by a quality or a qualified professor who understands the nitty gritties of my course and in terms of translating this particular document to, for our students to easily understand the accesses, then we can build that from our own institutions and within our region to ensure that quality is met and standards are met. So I really um, uh, support the fact that who, who should we benchmark with and who sets the standards? And I say, we can set our own standards. We understand our people. We know our challenges. We understand our institutions with their, I mean, with their uh, challenges, financially, and otherwise. So we can localize this to suit our own local needs, and hence build standards that generate and build our own people, and then promote the integration of OER and ICT in our teaching and learning. Um, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Judith. Um, we are in the chat, uh, uh, um, Barbara, uh, uh, how many policies can we have? Um, we are saying that government should have policies, and how many policies uh, can we have? And he has a follow up questions of um, what are the challenges of, of, of implementing. Uh, he says, are there any challenges in OERs without institutional OER and national OER policies? Uh, what's your take on that, please? And then uh, probably, Gabriel, you could um, uh, prepare yourself to probably follow up with one more question or a comment. Thank you. Over to you, Judy. Uh, thank you very much for that. Now, how many policies? <laughs> I think in our institutions, we have a number of policies depending on uh, what the mission and vision of these institutions are meant to meet. Now, an educational policy is a drive, a guideline that should uh, streamline the actions of the institutions. Now, if we, um, I mean, we narrow it down to focus on the promotion of the use of OER and ICT in teaching and learning, then we need policies that are relevant specifically to that, that will lead us towards delivering on how quality OER materials can be developed and shared out there for anybody, anywhere, 
across the globe to use and reuse to localize, I mean, to uh, solve their own local problems. So the number is not the issue. The issue is, do we have, can we come up with policies that are implementable? that will promote and enhance the integration of OER and ACT in our teaching and learning? Are we in a position to ensure that each and every child, irrespective of where you hail from, you can access the very basic education and the, which have a good quality, which have a good quality enough to take you to a next level in life? That is basically what I call a holistic transformation. And education systems should therefore have those policies that need to be implemented. Now, when it comes to the aspect of challenges, you cannot run away from this. Dr building up these courses that need to be shared out there, or the entire process of building the OER policies for the institutions takes time. So time is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is something to wrestle with. And not just time. Who do we bring on board to help in drawing up these policies? When we constitute the right policies, we don't stop after constituting them. We need to uh, implement them so that they have a sense of direction to the institution. Now, the other challenge that I would say that there's some cost implications, and I mentioned this before, that cost is a factor. Where monies are going to be spent in our institutions, and you know this very well, is normally a, a, a problem. People will always say no when they want to spend on things that they don't see as primary to their initial goals. And also most of our leadership like uh, to remain at the status quo. When you bring in a new idea, Change is usually a challenge. Change is a problem. Not everyone embraces change. Change is a process too. So the other challenge would be that we want to bring in something new into our institution that will definitely shake the status quo. So we have to be very persistent. We have to be patient, but we must be very, very articulate on what we want to achieve. Challenges will never lack. We have a number, so many of them. And also, when you bring many people on board to help in coming up with a specific policy, the, you know, reaching a consensus can be very difficult. Not everybody is for this. Others are for other directions. So you really have to create that environment that is conducive enough for each and every participant to feel to it that I have, a, uh, I have something out of this. It is for the benefit of the institution, the benefit of my department, the benefit of my own uh, area, and of course for my course that I teach and for the research that I will undertake. So if we involve them to undertake certain researches, this would be one way of motivating the, I mean, the stakeholders and through that we, they can, we can end up winning to the level where we find our developed policies implemented. Uh, uh, thank you, Asante. Um, uh, do you have a follow-up uh, comment, uh, Gabriel, uh, from your Zambia um, uh, experience, please? You, are, you yeah, need to unmute. Your mic. Oh, great! You need to unmute your mic, Gabriel. Hmm. Well, I, I think, Gabriel, you need to unmute your mic. Ah, there you are. Okay, you got it. Go on. Okay. Uh, uh, I have a to hear me. Uh, but, but, but you, have a bit, you have a bit of an echo. Can you come closer to your, to your mic? Okay. Yeah, yes, and I think we want to say that uh, perhaps in the, this is like uh, ours where all you have. Gabby, Gabriel, you area. need your your voice, your sound is not very good. I wonder what are you using because it's not very good. We can't quite hear you. Okay, Sorry. let me. Uh, ah, that's better now. That's better. There is a bit of a. I was using a, a headset. I was saying maybe in a context like ours, where uh, 
OERs is of OERs is just growing. Perhaps it would be good to have the use of champions. I don't know whether Judith has any comments on where champions have worked and how successful it has been in encouraging others, the SWA adopters, to use OERs. Uh, I missed I, that. I, I think uh, uh, Gabriel is asking if we can have champions for all years, um, if, if that would work. I think that's what, because uh, his sound is not too good. Perhaps, uh, Gabriel, yes, you could type yes. in the... Is that what you're saying? If not, then please yes. type in the, in, the, in the text chat, yes. Yeah, you got it correctly, yes. Okay, yes, okay. champions in all year, yes. Yes, I think like in any other uh, in any other field where we have people who are really out there, uh, like activists, you know, they're out there pushing for the human rights, pushing out for you know cultural education. We also have to come out. I am one of the champions here on OER. Actually, they call me a champion OER. I wonder whether I am have reached that level yet, <laughs> but I am struggling, and really I need support. If we come together, the um, the power of collaboration is very important. If we have to achieve this, then we need to form a, we need to form a, a group or we need to come up as a team who speak the same language of the like-minded, and then we push for these policies in our various institutions. I think if we collaborate as institutions, or we form groups, we form, we form, we form collabs. This will help us to actually push ahead this need for great actions for OER use and integration in our teaching and learning. So I, I agree with you, Gabriel. Yes, we need to come up with a team of champions so that things can happen. And we follow up whether they are being done the right way, the way we uh, desire them to be. Then we are going to move forward and push this dream and let it get achieved. I am wondering if um, a follow-up question that had been asked a little earlier by Tony, um, he had asked, what, how can Emerge Africa help uh, in OER? What, what, in which way can Emerge Africa help? And perhaps you, you have thought through it. Uh, okay, that question has already been answered, Irene. Oh, it's already been answered? I'm not left out. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I thought, I thought, um, yeah, anyway, uh, that's good then, if it's been answered. Um, any other, since you are, you're on, Tony, any other observation um, as we come to the close of, of the session? Yeah, I mean, the observation, interestingly, is that it roots back to the first observation made by Judith about why it is that OER matters in Africa and why it is that openness is a long-standing local tradition and culture across most of Africa and is not something which needs to be seen as imported from the rest of the world. Uh, and I think that those connections can be made strongly, even though cultures have changed and are changing. Um, it can create more, a better sense of congruence um, and a better sense of this is what we do as a community. So I really like the way you're linking something which is really about a kind of more of a kind of postmodern development and education with very old pre-modern traditions. Thanks, Judith. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, so any, any parting shots, uh, uh, Judy? Um, or any one of the questions that I, you feel you still need to tackle, but uh, you can, you can um, just have a, like a, a, a final word. Uh, basically, I think I need to call for collaborative efforts. And uh, I'm very glad that my listeners and those who are viewing us from everywhere across the globe are, are listening to the gaps that we still have in our institutions. And I call upon um, all the well-wishers where, you know, like uh, we are very green still in promoting online education. We are very, very behind still to understand the need of open licensing before you share any educational resources out there. We also need to build our capacities with regards to uh, 
uh, the information literacy, and even having the right tools, the right search engines to lead us towards getting the right resource that I can use to enrich my teaching and learning during my trainers. How can I, as an educator in a higher learning institution, ensure that I have the right standards uh, of, of, of resources that I share with my students to learn? Now, can I also ensure that the courses that I'm, I'm going to develop to put out there for uh, uh, anyone's use, how, how, can I, how can we build uh, proper and right MOOCs that would definitely respond to the need of a particular student found down way back in the up country? Those are really my, uh, still my urge to get a team that we can do a collaborative effort towards promoting the development of the rightful courses and of good quality and then build policies that are implemented in our universities. And you know, we can come up with policies, they will embrace them, but then how, are they, how will they be able to implement them? That is always my plea and my cry. I call upon all of you to join me in this journey. Let us work as a team. Let us come up with proposals. Let us find out where we can get uh, support from uh, anywhere else. Then we, we build these courses. Then we form teams. We form uh, collaborations that will help us come with wonderful uh, uh, policies uh, as, a, you know, as a region. We can also come up with policies as a region that in East Africa, in Central Africa, or in South Southern Africa, these are the policies that we propose that institutions can, can, can use to enhance their teaching and learning and to promote the integration of OER and ICT. I think, Irene, that will be a good move. That will be the champions that Gabriel yearns for. Let us all be champions in this, coming up with global or regional policies that can be implemented as a team. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Judith. Uh, but, uh, again, I wish to congratulate you on, on your doctorate. Um, thank you for being so passionate, as, as Tony says, uh, so uh, he says persuasive too. Uh, I think you've touched on quite a number of things that we need to think about as we move forward with OER. And uh, of course, uh, also Emerge Africa has heard um, about how they can collaborate. We appreciate you. And as we come to an end, I have shared um, a link that the participants can use to just give feedback of the webinar. If you can, please, there's a, a link that I've just shared to give mm -hmm. us a feedback of, of, of that. So we'll appreciate that if you could uh, just click on it and give us that. Um, uh, yes, Tony, um, you'd like to say something, please? Sorry, I'm putting Tony on the uh, on the spot. Sorry. Um, yes, please I feel that. <laughs> yes. Please go is, ahead. Yes. <laughs> please share your feedback before you leave, because once you've left, you may never come back to share the feedback, and we want to know now while your ideas and your emotions are still fresh. So let us know now, please, before you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think uh, 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 Dr. Judith, uh, your your passion <laughs> your passion is being shared across uh, uh, the room today. So please uh, fill in the, the the feedback before you leave. And thank you again so much. And thank you for joining us. I noticed that we have people from from the Middle East. Thank you so much. Uh, our own Mohammed was in the house. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you. And let's keep this. Uh, uh, you know, conversation going. Thank you again, Judy, and have a good afternoon. Bye for Thank now. You. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything. Much appreciated. <laughs>